So we'll talk a little bit about the hope for a stem cell transplant uh, for sickle cell disease. I have at Riley Hospital for Children and IU Health, uh, as much as I'd like this to be a commercial for our program and for IU Health, it's really not other than the perspective of, if I could refer Indiana patients to the best person doing transplants for sickle cell disease and thalassemia, I would refer you to Guido Lucarelli. Unfortunately for people in central Indiana, Guido practices in Rome. <laughs> so unless you are able to go to Rome for six months to a year to get your transplant, that's really not an option. So I'm gonna to stick to things that we can offer locally or at least in the Midwest. There we go. So one, one brief disclosure, just to be completely honest, uh, I am the medical director of a local biotech company. We'll talk about a non-exclusive emphasis on the non. A lot of uh, industry and academic places are interested in cellular therapies. So there is a product that we've produced to use for transplantation, uh, but again, it's non-exclusive. I don't know where I'm. So I will provide an overview, overview of stem cell transplant for sickle cell diseases, why sickle cell should be considered for sickle cell patients, risks and benefits, and some new developments. And then again, an overview of some of these therapies that are available here in Indiana. I don't know where I'm supposed to be. We'll just do it that way. All right, some definitions. Sickle cell disease, or SCD, will refer to all of the sickle hemoglobinopathies. Uh, stem cell transplant's a general term. You also heard bone marrow transplant, blood and marrow transplant, hematopoietic cell transplant. These are essentially interchangeable terms and refer to replacing one person's diseased marrow with somebody else's healthy marrow. So why do we need to consider this? I think our keynote speaker this morning really hit the nail on the head. Um, the lifespan of sickle cell patients is 40 years and it really hasn't increased much. If anything, it's decreased over the last 20 years. So again, transplant replaces a sickle cell patient's diseased marrow with healthy donor marrow and is the only curative therapy for sickle cell disease at this time. So current evidence suggests that transplant for sickle cell disease can not only prevent symptoms such as painful episodes and deterioration of organ function, uh, but also stabilize and even restore prior organ function, especially lung and nervous system complications like problems from strokes. So this all sounds great, so why don't we use this more often? Well, we got a number of problems. Uh, first and foremost is the lack of suitable donors or people who are able to donate bone marrow for use in transplantation. Second, we have a number of risks of stem cell transplant. The patient selection itself, who's the best person to get a transplant, and then the risks of the procedure. And then the third one, which we're addressing right now, is lack of patient and physician knowledge and interest. So problem number one, finding a suitable donor for a transplant. There's three main categories of donors you can use for a stem cell transplant. You can use a related donor, an unrelated donor, or in gray, is a self-donor. For the most part, donating for yourself, that would just give your own sickle cell disease back. So that wouldn't be terribly helpful. However, I will mention at the tail end of the talk, gene therapy is an up and coming therapy for sickle cell disease and that would use a patient's own marrow stem cells uh, for this procedure. So that, that may have a role in the future. So we can get stem cells from a number of different sources. Um, bone marrow patient, go, the donor goes to the operating room and it's harvested from the hip bones. Um, 
if there are any patients uh, with sickle cell disease in the room, you may be familiar with this machine. Uh, that's the same type of machine that red cell exchanges are done on. But in this case, this person is donating stem cells and the machine is being used to collect stem cells out of his peripheral blood for a transplant. So either stem cells from either of these sources can be used for transplant. So family members are the best type of donors to use for a number of reasons. Family members who are parents and full siblings can be considered as donors if they're relatively healthy, they have normal hemoglobin or sickle cell trait, and they are an HLA match. So this is, HLA is human leukocyte antigen or white blood cell antigen match. Uh, usually a 10 of 10 or a 9 of 10 match is required uh, for a successful transplant. So as I mentioned, uh, related donors are the best option by far. Transplants using family donors have the highest chance of success with the fewest complications. Most current studies are in the 85 to 90% success rate. As, uh, this is patients being cured of their sickle cell disease. Uh, there are some complications with transplant that you can die during the procedure. Uh, the most recent studies show a 93% survival rate. So it's possible for you to get the transplant and it not to take, but then you still survive the procedure and you go on to plan B with medical management of your sickle cell as you've done in the past. The biggest problem with related donors is we don't have enough of them. Only 14% of sickle cell patients have a matched related donor which leads us to have to consider alternatives. So unrelated donors are what we go to next if there's no available family donor. These are usually adult donors. Uh, we find these through the National Marrow Donor Program. We get the tissue typing of the patient, we put it into the computer and it spits out if there are any potential matches nationwide or worldwide. What are the biggest problems with unrelated donors? Well, first and foremost is you might not be able to find one. The person may not exist for your particular tissue type, or they may be out there in the world, but they're just not in the registry, so you're invisible to us. Another problem that seems to be more and more common in our practice lately is there's patients that exist, but they're not readily available. Uh, most people in the military right now are required, I guess when you go into the military, you sign away rights to your own body and tissue. You're automatically placed in the marrow donor program. The military though likes to send you off to these lovely places like Afghanistan and stuff for nine to 12 months at a time and not make you available for transplant. So you're there, you're in the registry, you're in the computer, but we can't get access to your cells, at least for a period of time. Pregnancy, obviously, also is another reason you'd want to wait a little while. Generally, an re unrelated donor requires a better match than a related donor. Usually, we have to have a 10 of 10 perfect match because with less matching, the risk of transplant go up. Our other option is umbilical cord blood. This is just a little freezing cassette with the... Uh, uh, plastic bag holding the cord blood sitting inside the, the freezer cassette. So umbilical cord blood has to be collected and frozen down at the time a baby's born. The advantages of using cord blood, cord, uh, unfortunately, even though I've been working on this for 10 years, we do not have a public cord blood bank here in Indiana, much to my uh, dissatisfaction. Uh, but there are places around the country that any woman who's pregnant can donate her baby's cord blood. My daughter's cord blood, my daughter was born in St. Louis when we were there. Hers went into the St. Louis cord blood bank. Our son was born here, his went to the research lab. Uh, <laughs> gotta, gotta use it somehow. Um, cord blood's advantages are it requires less stringent matching. We only do six antigen matching for cord blood and a four of six, a five of six, or a six of six is acceptable for this. So its flexibility makes it more likely that you're gonna find an acceptable cord blood unit to transplant your patient. 
It's available immediately when you want it. It's sitting frozen in somebody's freezer. All you gotta do is have it FedEx to where you are so that you can use it. So very available. It also has a lower risk of graft versus host disease. We'll talk about graft versus host disease more in a moment, but that's one of the complications of transplant. So what are the disadvantages for cord blood? The main one is size. As you can imagine, especially you ladies who've had children or dads who've been in the delivery room, the cord's only so long and it's only got so much blood in it. Uh, finding, some, finding a cord big enough to transplant somebody my size because you have to have a given number of cells per pound of body weight to make it successful. Uh, we'd have a real hard time transplanting meat with a cord. I would have to find a marrow donor. Uh, some small petite lady, even an adult or a child, has a much higher chance of finding a cord blood unit that's going to work. Um, units are donated anonymously, so even if they were donated, like my daughter, who's now 15, uh, there's no linkage to go back and ask her to give more marrow to boost the cord. So you got to use the cord either, you got to take it by itself, take it or leave it. The only option otherwise is there are double cord transplants that are under investigation where you take two cord bloods, mix them together to get a big enough cell dose to work for the transplant and use those. And we've used those a number of times and they can work quite well. Again, with a less close of a match, there are higher risk of complications, although it does still work in the cord blood setting where it wouldn't work in a marrow setting. There are a couple of experimental approaches that we don't use currently at Riley. Or, or um, there are a couple of protocols among our adult colleagues at um, University Hospital that they are using. We try not to use mismatched unrelated donors like eight of 10 or nine of 10 unrelated donors. The complication rate is just really high with them. Um, so why would I want to use a haploidentical donor? Haplo means half match. The interest in using a half match donor, especially as a pediatric transplanter, is if you have a kid, you almost certainly have one parent at least to come with them, and your parents are guaranteed to be half a match since you get half your genes from mom, half from dad, you've automatically got a half match donor. You have to do special manipulations in the lab to make it work, which are rather complicated. So both of these types of transplants should only be done on a research study at an experienced transplant center. Not every place offers these. So summarizing donors so far, related donors are best if you have one. Unrelated donors can work if you can find one. And cord blood can be useful, but it's often limited to children and smaller adults. So currently, the best recommendations for patients with sickle cell disease is that if you have a match-related donor, a family member who is able to serve as a donor, go to transplant at a young age because the outcomes are excellent. If an unrelated donor is available, transplant should be considered, but only as part of a research study and only if certain disease criteria, which we'll talk about in a minute, are met. Problem number two, there are a lot of risks with doing a transplant. Some of these, you know, this is not an inclusive list, but some of these include identifying who's a good candidate, who are the right patients to get a transplant. Uh, poor engraftment, graft versus host disease, and the toxic toxicity and efficacy of the conditioning regimen. We'll go through each of those individually. So identifying good candidates. This is one of the biggest, hairiest, painful challenges in all of sickle cell. Uh, if you have leukemia and it's not responding very well to chemo, if you have uh, certain other types of malignancy, testicular cancer, which IU is famous for, it's automatically go to transplant because you've got your best chance of cure with this. Well, cancer's easy because if you don't treat it, you're gonna die anyway, so you might as well take your chances on being cured, as my colleague Kent Robertson likes to say, 
Your choice is death or maybe not death. Take your pick. Um, like Nicole, our panelist from this morning, who seems to be doing relatively well with hydrea there, hydroxyurea, she'd have to think rather hard about, does she want to take a chance of death to be cured, or does she want to kind of go on like she's doing now and hope that her disease progression over the years is relatively slow? And, and that there's no algorithm, there's no mathematical equation that'll give you a right answer for this. So our problems as transplanters is we don't want to pay, put patients at risk if they don't have very many problems. On the flip side, once patients start to have problems, strokes, poor kidney function, poor lung function, then they may no longer be a candidate to receive a transplant. So our real dilemma with sickle cell disease is there isn't a test to predict disease severity. If we had two one-year-olds in front of us, there's no blood test, there's no scan, there's no anything for saying, Johnny's going to have lots of problems, lots of painful crises, lots of hospitalizations, acute chests. Jimmy's not. We don't have any of these things. In addition, patients have to meet basic criteria for organ and cognitive and social function in order to receive a transplant. Dr. Hugh this morning talked about the patient uh, whose parents were about getting ready to be divorced about the time he needed his transplant. So you got to make sure these things are worked out. And again, many older kids and adults, because of the complications from their disease, are no longer good candidates for transplant. Sorry this is so busy, um, but it'll get the point across. This is from a review article by Shalini Shinoy, who's a uh, leader in the field of transplantation for sickle cell disease. If you have a matched sibling donor, look at the list below. Strokes, elevated transcranial Doppler velocities, acute chest syndrome, uh, vaso-occlusive events, uh, pulmonary hypertension, osteonecrosis, revascular necrosis, silent strokes, uh, kidney disease. Those are reasons to go to transplant if you have a matched sibling donor. The middle column is pretty much the same thing, but maybe a little bit worse. So how do you pick between the two of them? That's what's really unclear in the field at the moment. To go to a higher risk transplant, like a mismatched donor transplant or a half-matched haploidentical transplant, you know, recurrent strokes despite being on chronic transfusion therapy, uh, in, inability to take, uh, tolerate supportive care like you're not able to get chronic transfusions because of alloimmunization, not able to tolerate hydroxyurea, things like that would prompt you to consider uh, a higher risk transplant. Again, the criteria for Recommending a patient get a transplant is relatively fluid. It, 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 there's nothing set in stone here. If a matched family donor is available, transplants recommended even in young children with few symptoms because they do really well. 90% of them are cured. Uh, high risk transplants should be reserved for patients meeting more stringent criteria, meaning more severe disease. But as usual, you ask 10 doctors, you'll probably get eight different answers for defined severe disease. And that's where more dialogue between providers and patients are needed. So poor engraftment is a problem with transplants as well. What do I mean by engraftment? Uh, the common word for that is it takes. The, the, does, it, does the marrow take? Does the donor marrow set up shop and start to grow and make new blood cells within the patient? So the biggest problem leading to poor engraftment is prior transfusions. The more exposure to somebody else's blood that you have, the more your immune, immune system starts to attack somebody else's blood and blood cells and the greater chance of rejection. The risk of non-engraftment or graft rejection is up to 20% in some of the older studies, like from the 90s. It's getting better uh, in more modern studies, but these are since you have to follow patients for five, 10 years before you can publish your paper and report, uh, that's the data that's in the literature at the moment. 
So ways to improve engraftment, first one's easy, getting better matched donors. And the second one is better conditioning regimens, which is another slide in just a moment. Graft versus host disease is a complication in which the donor cells attack the host's body. So even if you do a transplant from one brother into another brother, the two little guys are different on a, on a molecular level. The one brother's cells are going to see the other brother's body as a slightly different place from where it came from, and it could attack that and cause something called graft-versus-host disease. Usually a skin rash, like the patient's red palms that I'm showing there, is the most common symptom. The gut can also be affected, causing vomiting and diarrhea, difficulty gaining weight. Uh, the liver can also be affected. Uh, pretty much any organ system can be affected, but those are the three that are the most common. It occurs in an acute form, defined as the first 100 days after the transplant. <coughs> Excuse me. And a chronic form, which means after the first 100 days of transplant. For sickle cell patients, this is all bad. You may have heard things about graft-versus-host disease before. If you're a cancer patient, your donor cells can also see your cancer is doubly bad. Cancer patients who have a little bit of graft versus host disease have a lower rate of relapse. So you get some benefit from this. Sickle cell patients, you don't have anything to relapse from. You just need good red blood cells. So there's absolutely no benefit to a sickle cell patient having graft versus host disease in any form. In sickle cell patients in general, these are just numbers for all comers to transplant. 20 to 40% of patients get acute graft versus host disease, and uh, 30 to 60% with unrelated, that's with match related donors, 30 to 60% with unrelated donors. Chronic graft versus host disease that, that can last for years occurs in 20 to 60% of patients. And unfortunately for us people with hair that's getting white, uh, graft versus host disease incidence increases with age. Another, another reason to take care of kids. So graft versus host disease is prevented by having a well-matched donor and with immune suppressive drugs. Graft versus host disease is by no means a death sentence. It's very often treatable. More than two thirds of the cases are successfully treated. However, it can be chronic, can be very bad and contribute to a patient's death. So we'd like to avoid it if at all possible. There's really nothing peculiar about sickle cell disease that makes it more likely to occur in sickle cell patients or makes it more severe. But the thing to, that I as a physician am mindful of is I don't want to trade one chronic disease for another. You've already got sickle cell. I don't want to swap your sickle cell for chronic graft versus host disease. Lastly, conditioning regimen. So what do I mean by conditioning? Conditioning is the chemo and or radiation that's used to get the patient ready to accept the donor cells. If I had the two brothers up here again, I took marrow from one and put it in the other and didn't use any chemo or radiation, it wouldn't take. So you've got to do something to make the donor marrow take in the patient's body. On the other hand, you only, extra conditioning, like some of the other speakers have talked about, giving that big gun cancer type therapy uh, just causes toxicity without any additional benefits. So the goals of conditioning are to reduce the patient's marrow. You're more or less making space inside of their bones for the donor cells to go to and to start growing. You also want to suppress the patient's immune system to accept the donor cells and not reject the graft. And again, the big key is striking a balance between achieving those goals and excess toxicity. What are some of these toxicities? Uh, this uh, poor little guy here, all that white stuff, those are ulcers in his mouth caused by chemotherapy, so this is called mucositis, or mucous membrane damage from chemotherapy or radiation. Uh, chemotherapy and radiation can cause end organ damage, uh, kidney, lung, heart, 
unfortunately, the same organs that are also affected by sickle cell disease. Uh, a condition in the liver called sinusoidal obstruction syndrome or veno-occlusive disease, uh, again, sort of a, similar to the veno-occlusion that occurs with sickle cell. Hemorrhagic cystitis is bleeding from the bladder due to a side effect of chemotherapy. Uh, anytime you give chemotherapy and radiation, you're reducing the patient's white blood cell counts, putting them at high risk for infection, and then possibly infertility depending on the amount of chemo or radiation that's used. So lots of nasty side effects to consider. So again, for sickle cell disease, we want to use as little as possible. Sickle cell is not a malignant disease. It's not cancer, so we don't need huge doses of these drugs. And we have to also be mindful that the patients may already have organ dysfunction and not tolerate high doses. Uh, the published risk of death for sickle cell patients going through a transplant of dying in the first 30 days is about 10%. So it's not a trivial number. It's small, but it's by no means trivial. So as Dr. Hsu and some of our other speakers have mentioned, with a traditional bone marrow transplant, you use what's called myeloablative therapy. This completely wipes out the patient's own marrow. Uh, that's good if you got leukemia, because you want to completely get rid of all those bad cells. But sickle cell is not leukemia. Uh, myeloablative therapy is highly toxic and, as I mentioned, sometimes fatal, just getting through the treatment. The benefit of giving myeloablative therapy is you've wiped out the patient's sickle cell marrow. The only thing that's going to be left after the transplant is the donor's good cells good marrow that's going to make normal red blood cells. But the price is very high to pay with the myeloablative transplant. The, the hope for the future, and we already have evidence that this is far superior, is what's called non-myeloablative or reduced intensity transplants. These use lower doses of chemo and radiation. They have much less toxicity. And this works on a concept of that a mixed donor chimerism can be curative. Chimerism is just a Greek, wor Greek word, if you like Greek mythology, chimera. That's like the uh, lion's head on a horse's body kind of thing. It's a mixture, like half and half. For many non-malignant diseases of the blood, like sickle cell, as little as 25% donor marrow can be curative. So the, patient, the patient's bone marrow, if we took a sample, sent it to the lab to see who's who. 75% of it's the patient's original marrow, 25% from the donor, but when you look at their blood counts, they're making far more cells with normal hemoglobin. There's, it suppresses the number of sickle cells and the complications of the sickle cell disease are essentially gone. So you don't have to completely wipe out the sickle marrow in order to cure the disease. So there are, I won't bore you since I know there's, I'm the only transplanter in the room, uh, <laughs> with all the arcane different uh, myeloablative regimens that are under investigation, it's too early to say that there's one best one. The one that Lucarelli uses is the, different than the one that's used in Chicago, which is different than the one that we use, blah, blah, blah. But there's a number that show great promise, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples. There's one apparent key drug that's really made a difference in the last several years. It's a drug called alemtuzumab, or the trade name is Campath. So I'll get a little bit scientific here on you. So it's a monoclonal antibody. So it's not even a chemo drug. It's an antibody, which is a natural protein, against a marker called CD52 on the surface of white blood cells. So it binds to white blood cells and causes them to die. So this wipes out both the B cells and the T cells in the patient. So why do I want to do this? It suppresses the immune system so it allows the donor cells to engraft. It gets rid of the cells that can reject the donor marrow, in other words. The other good thing too is it's, it's a protein that lasts for weeks to months within the patient's system. 
So it also gets rid of a bunch of the lymphocytes in the donor marrow once we do the transplant, and it reduces your risk of graft-versus-host disease. So it's doing double duty. Helps the donor marrow to get in and to take, and reduces the complication once it's in there. So this has really made a big difference for transplantation. Too bad Dr. Hsu had to leave. This is one of the patients he was talking about in that Chicago study by his adult colleague. Uh, I just, I did not talk to him before the conference and arrange for this, but I just kind of found it on that uh, wonderful uh, medical journal, sciencedaily.com. So this is a, I think 35 year old lady uh, with uh, SS disease. She had her first episode of dactylitis when she was eight months old. Uh, she did not have a matched family donor. She didn't have a huge number of complications until she became pregnant and had her daughter. That's her daughter kissing her. Since having her daughter, she's been in and out of the hospital for the last 15 years. Uh, her only wish was to be home day and night with her daughter and stop having to go to the hospital all the time. So she enrolled on this study in Chicago, getting a transplant from an unrelated donor. The study that's going on in Chicago that Dr. Hsu mentioned before and that this lady got was based on this preliminary study from the National Institutes of Health outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, and it was the first case of using non-myeloblative transplantation for sickle cell patients. So the conditioning regimen for this was using five doses of alemtuzumab, this CAMPATH drug that's a protein, it's not even a chemo drug, remember and 300 centigray or 300 rads of radiation. Normally we give 12 to 1400 centigray of radiation for like say transplanting a leukemia patient. If you are getting radiation to your bowel or breast or something like that for cancer, you'll get between two and 5,000 rads. So 300 is a pretty, pretty weenie dose in the radiation therapy world. So the purpose of both of these two treatments, again, the alemtuzumab was to get rid of those lymphocytes to reduce graft rejection, to reduce graft versus host disease. The little dose of radiation was used for further immune suppression and to kind of make space within the marrow to, for, so the donor cells have somewhere to go. So they looked at 10 adult sickle cell patients. All 10 of them survived at least two and a half years after the transplant. Nine out of 10 engrafted. So the one person who didn't engraft, their own marrow grew back because this was not myeloablative. It didn't completely wipe out their own marrow. The donor cells didn't take, but their own marrow grew back. So the worst thing that happened was they probably spent a month in the hospital and ended up where they were beforehand which not great, but not the worst thing that can happen either. No patients in these 10 or out of the nine that engrafted developed graft versus host disease. So this was groundbreaking because this is the kind of numbers that we've gotten with kids getting transplants from a sibling. So th this, was, this is unheard of in the adult world. Really great stuff. So a lot of different places are using this transplant regimen now I think Dr. Hsu said they've treated 25 patients in Chicago and 24 of them have been grafted. So very similar results, just phenomenal. Uh, in pediatrics, we've taken a little bit different tack. Um, used alemtuzumab again, same CAMPATH drug. Used fludarabine, which is another drug that wipes out lymphocytes. And then in pediatrics, we're allergic to giving small kids radiation, does bad things to brain cells. So we give them a chemo drug called Melphalan instead. Uh, gets the same thing done, kind of makes some space in the bone marrow, but it's not as bad for a developing kid as the radiation is. In this study to date, 47 patients were enrolled. 39 of them had sickle cell disease. The other eight had thalassemia, a non-sickling uh, hemoglobinopathy. 
there was one graft rejection. This was a child that had a related cord. So there was a child with um, sickle cell disease. The parents had another baby who didn't have sickle cell disease. They collected the cord blood when that baby was born and used it to transplant the older sibling. Uh, four of the patients were mixed chimeras, and amazingly, uh, the rest of them were 100% donor. So they weren't even a mixture, they were all donor cells. Uh, all but the one patient that had the graft rejection are disease-free, uh, and we at Riley, can, uh, I think we put one or two patients on this study out of the 39 with the sickle cell. So we were a participating center in this. For patients who, kids that don't have a matched related donor, uh, we also participated in the SKIRT study. SKIRT stands for Sickle Cell Unrelated Donor Transplant Trial. Again, for children with either sickle cell disease or thalassemia. Used the same conditioning regimen as for the other kids, but used unrelated donors, either marrow or cord blood. This one was kind of a mixed bag. Uh, the study was stopped early on the cord blood half uh, due to poor engraftment. Five out of the first eight patients, the cord blood didn't take. So obviously what we were doing was not enough to get the graft in. Uh, and that portion of the study was uh, published in Biology of Blood and Marrow Transplantation two years ago. Uh, the marrow arm of the study, on the other hand, did much better. Uh, it's almost reached its accrual goal and uh, a paper will be written on it um, very soon. But because the cord blood didn't work very well, the uh, main drivers of the study wanted to try to get better engraftment with the cord blood, so they started a new study called Earth. I think it's unrelated transplant with hydroxyurea. So one of the things that they did to improve this is they added hydroxyurea for a month before transplant to improve hemoglobin and, and uh, take advantage of one of the side effects of hydroxyurea of the myelosuppression or knocking down your blood counts since you're gonna do a transplant anyway. And they also added thiotepa, which is another chemo drug, to the melphalan in order to make some more space and increase engraftment. So 28 uh, patients have been enrolled to date with a goal of 40. Most of these are sickle cell patients. There's only been one graft failure so far in one of the cord blood patients. A very low incidence of graft versus host disease, especially in the cord blood recipients. And the study is now looking at adding new agents to decrease graft versus host disease for some mismatch related donor patients to get good results, but then expand our pool of potential donors for transplant. About four more slides and I'll quit boring you. Uh, two last novel therapies, one of which is, uh, both, both of which are near and dear to my heart, uh, mesenchymal stem cells and gene therapy. Mesenchymal cells, if you've never heard of these from the newspaper, the news, or the literature before, these are adult type stem cells. You can get them from all sorts of places. You can get them from bone marrow. Uh, you can get them from fat. There's a lot of places getting them from uh, people that have undergone liposuctions. So I could make some stem cells. Uh, uh, teeth, the dental pulp and, and extracted wisdom teeth, menstrual blood. There's all sorts of places that these cells can be <laughs> obtained from. I didn't say it was appetizing, I just said you can get the cells from them. So, um, there's two major interests in using mesenchymal cells no matter where they came from. One's for regenerative medicine. Mesenchymal cells can help regenerate damaged tissues. I saw, I think on you know, the Today Show or something, the docs in Sweden transplanted an esophagus into a patient that they made in the lab. They made kind of a, like a nylon tube and then they seeded cells on it to make a tissue esophagus that they could transplant into a patient who lost their esophagus due to cancer. So mesenchymal cells are the cells that were used to make that esophagus. Uh, we're looking at it in the lab to regenerate bone. Like if you had a very badly broken bone or had a bone cancer and had to have a piece of it removed, can we regenerate that bone 
using these stem cells. The other big interest to transplant is that these cells are immune suppressive. So it's a different way other than drugs to get immune suppression. So we think they can help donor marrow and graft and they can also prevent or treat graft versus host disease. Now this is for a different disease called Fanconi anemia, but it's another non-malignant hematologic disorder, so it can kind of be grouped in the same family as sickle cell in that respect. But we made cells at Cook General Biotechnology, that's the disclosure, uh, and transplanted them into a patient at Riley along with bone marrow from her brother to help the bone marrow and graft better and to prevent graft versus host disease. Now this is a one patient trial, so you can't really draw a whole lot of conclusions, but she engrafted very rapidly, she had no graft versus host disease, and she had no toxicity. So one of the things that we'd like to do in the future is make MSCs for sickle cell patients who have difficulty in grafting and don't need any graft versus host disease as well. And again, we're not the only place that are, that's interested in this, but. And lastly, gene therapy. Uh, with gene therapy, the goal is not to replace the cell, but to replace that bad beta globin gene that has the mutation in it. So we would take the patient's own bone marrow with sickle cell, with, with the sickle cell mutation, take it to the lab, infect it with a virus that contains the normal beta globin gene and then put the cells back into the patient. The virus containing the normal gene will start making normal hemoglobin and fix the patient's own cells. So at least that's the goal. So the, the big advantage of that is it uses the patient's own marrow. You can't have any graft versus host disease, it's your own cells. Uh, you don't have to worry about finding a donor because you're already here. Uh, the problem is, um, the beta globin gene is a pain in the butt. It's a huge gene that has extremely complex regulation. So trying, uh, us dumb people, trying to tell it how to regulate itself and make the right amount of hemoglobin and when to make it, when to turn on, when to turn off is very hard. It's, it's a huge gene, so it's also hard to fit in a virus. Small genes are better for the virus transfer. Um, so there's a lot of details to work out. Uh, there's various centers doing trials for uh, gene therapy for sickle cell disease. Uh, there's a lot been done actually, looks like he left, but at uh, St. Jude, uh, Don Cohn out at Children's Hospital Los Angeles uh, has a trial going now for this. Uh, I think you're going to see stuff in the news where this works in the very near future. I think it's still a few years away before us and Chicago and Indianapolis have it on a widespread basis, but you're going to hear news that this is working very sooner rather than later. So to summarize some of these things, the decision to pursue transplant if you're, a, if you're a sickle cell patient is not an easy one. It's not an easy one for the patient to decide that you want to undergo a risky procedure. It's not easy for their family because we didn't really talk about this, but most of the time with a transplant, you're in the hospital for four to six weeks. Then if you're a child, we keep you out of school for six months to a year while your immune system recovers. If you're an adult, you have to go back to work because somebody has to work and pay the bills and you're on your own to do the best you can to stay infection free and away from other people. Uh, it, it's a challenging period of time. Uh, it's not easy for the physicians either because we don't want to give you wrong advice. And like I mentioned with the graft versus host disease, the last thing we want to do is swap you one chronic disease for another one with graft versus host disease or say, oh yeah, you got a 90% chance. There's nothing that makes me feel worse. You got a 90% chance of doing good and you're in the 10% that doesn't. So we need to have multiple discussions between patients, families, and physicians in order to figure out who's actually the best group of patients to go forward with transplant. So it's good to discuss options with your transplant team uh, early on uh, to at least establish a rapport and talk about these things.
as I mentioned, the lack of markers or tests that predict uh, who's going to be a bad actor uh, really hampers us with transplant for sickle cell disease. And uh, I'm, I'm not aware of that coming to an end anytime in the near future. Uh, there's also a lack of consensus on who to transplant and at what time. The lack of suitable donors still is a problem. And then there's the risks to consider of the transplant itself. So once again, I, this is the same slide as before. Current recommendations would be if you are a child, with, especially a child with a matched related donor, go to transplant sooner rather than later. Don't wait to have a bunch of complications because you got a 90% chance that that child's gonna be cured of their sickle cell disease. And the younger you do it, the better chance they have. If an unrelated donor is available, you should think about it if you meet the certain disease criteria in that very busy slide that we showed before and as part of a research study, if at all possible. The non-myeloablative transplants have shown tremendous promise and give us hope for the future for improving outcomes while reducing toxicity. There's no one regimen, again, no magic regimen that is proven superior, but, but there's more than one way to skin a cat. I think a number of these are gonna probably be pretty much equal. And again, a continued dialogue is needed to determine who's the right fit and when the time's right. If I could leave you with two requests, so plea from a transplanter, number one, for both patients, parents, and physicians, please get the sickle cell kids typed, their parents and their full siblings typed sooner rather than later. We need to identify who these kids are and talk to the families and see who is a potential good risk for a transplant. Uh, it doesn't help a lot if there are siblings around or the parent, uh, parents can sometimes be a match as well, just by luck, um, but the child already has complications that could have been prevented if you would have done the transplant earlier. Lastly, to anybody who's interested in sickle cell disease at all, please join the National Marrow Donor Program as a potential marrow or stem cell donor and donate your baby's cord blood if you're a pregnant mom uh, to a bank if this is all possible. Uh, one caveat I'll throw in here. Um, we don't, again, we don't have a public cord blood bank in Indiana, but if you have a child with sickle cell disease as a, as a woman and you become pregnant again, uh, there is a federal insurance program that pays to have your baby's cord blood banked uh, without cost to you because you already have a child with a transplantable disease. This will be paid for. You can call us at the Riley Transplant Program and we'll help you arrange for this. Um, then, we can, then the cord blood can undergo tissue typing to see if it's a match for the older child and it's useful for transplant. And then we can make some plans from that. So I would not recommend family banking uh, in, in general because they're not used very well and uh, they're not used very often. And it uh, usually costs $2,500 or so to bank your own uh, cord blood privately, but if you already have a child with sickle cell disease, this can be paid for, so it, it, it'll be of no cost to the patients or their families. And again, the biggest reason for all of us to join the National Marrow Program is only 30 to 40 percent, even with all these expanded options I talked about, only 30 to 40 percent of sickle cell patients have a suitable donor, so less than half. And I will leave you with that. I want to thank uh, Shalini Shinoy from St. Louis for sharing some of her unpublished data that I shared with you today. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Hi, <laughs> I just want to say I'm Angela Tussell. I'm with Be Match, part of NMDP, and we have a table right out in the hallway. So I'm answering. Please go see Angela right after this. Yes. So easy to sign up and you could make a difference in someone's life. It's just filling out a form. 
and doing a cheek swab. Yeah, you don't have to even give blood anymore. You, you can do you know, the CSI thing and the, the Q-tip on the cheek and that's all that's required. You never have to give marrow itself until you're actually giving it for the transplant. Mm -hmm. um, I went to the university and our big students Riley, but I assume that um, most, all, all We have a lot of kids, I was talking to Dr. Treadwell about this. We have a lot of kids on our back burner list uh, of the transplant service that they either don't have a great donor option or the family has said at one point in time or another, do you wanna sit down and talk to the transplanters? No, not really. Yeah. And, and it, 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 it bothers me in some ways because I, I have a real heart for this disease and I think that we can cure a lot more people, especially with some of these more recent developments. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's hard to convince, it's easy to convince somebody with cancer to get a transplant. That, that, that's no problem whatsoever. With a chronic disease like sickle cell, knowing that they got to take a risk, they're going to have all these, they could have a lot of these complications. It's, it's a different, yeah. different conversation. Well, it's hard, I mean, it's kind of a too, if you're right. not sick a lot, then why would you? Why would you put yourself at risk? Yeah. Right. Um, lots of things going on. So at that point, then they're like, oh, yeah, maybe I do want to think about that. And so what do we do with those people that all of a sudden want to talk about it as young adults? Well, that's when we need to go back to Dr. Farag, who has a haploidentical uh, donor study for other diseases mm -hmm. and see if we can expand that into sickle cell to treat some of these folks before they get even worse. Yeah, okay. Because that's, that's what I'm hearing now. Right. Correct. But, um, but, it, but it, again, it's, it's walking that tightrope of when's right. the right time to go. Yeah. Right. right. So that, that's what I'm dealing with now is a lot of young adults that have heard about it and they think that this is going to be their answer, but either they don't, you know, they have, don't have a full sibling or, and they don't know about the other. Um, right. But, but again, I think with some of these non-myeloablative treatments that have come along in the last five years, this is, this is really changing things. And it, it say, you know, they're in their late 20s now and they transferred over to you, you know, when they were 20 from, yeah. from Riley. You know, we didn't have this stuff to talk about then. So, th no, they haven't heard it. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Sir. Well, like, like I said, if you count uh, sickle cell and thalassemia together, that you're in, the, you're in probably the few hundreds. Um, it, pardon? I think 400. Yeah. Uh, and, and then if you throw in people, you know, like uh, Guido Lucarelli in Rome, he, he's probably done 500 himself because he, he's in the thalassemia world, the, the, the Middle East and the Mediterranean is where thalassemia is very rich. And he, he pulls in all those populations in the Middle East. So probably worldwide, we, you're in the low thousands at this point. Um, so yeah. Depends, but uh, we, we try to weasel around it the best we can to, with, with, with a consult and with some of the indications. Okay. Um, but no, that, that remains a huge problem because it's probably $1,500, $2,000 to do 
HLA typing, and you certainly don't want to stick a family with that bill if the insurance says, well, you haven't jumped through the right hoops to cover it. So it, it, it is a problem. We, we, we try to combine enough, though, to see the patients and get the consult with the transplant team so that we kind of bundle it together. If there's no more questions, go visit Angela, please. It's her turn.